Hi, what I have here on the bench today is a Keithley 230 programmable voltage source. And this is another piece of Keithley test gear that I have always wanted to get my hands on. Just like any other Keithley test equipment, the 230 comes in this classic Keithley Brown enclosure, and overall it looks quite similar to many of the other Keithley equipment that I have here in the lab. You can see what it's sitting next to is a Keithley 196 bench multimeter that I'm going to use to test this 230 with. These two are identical in physical sizes. One thing that is slightly different is that the tactile button designs on these two units. The ones on this Keithley 230 are larger and square in size, which are similar to those found on my Keithley 705 scanner. But the ones on the Keithley 196 and the most other Keithley uh, ones that I have are narrower and uh, are more streamlined. The smaller button design, I believe, came later in Keithley's lineup. Anyway, this voltage source is really a precision four-quadrant low-current power supply, meaning it can output both positive and negative voltages and can also sink current in either of the polarities, and thus serve as an electronic load. If you recall, I did a teardown of an Agilent 66312A power supply before, and that one is only a two-quadrant power supply and is only able to source and sink in the positive voltage range. And if you're interested in the teardown of the Agilent 66312A, I'm going to leave a link down below. As a voltage source, the 230 can produce a precision voltage output from plus minus 50 microvolts and all the way up to plus minus 100 volts, which is very wide range and quite impressive. Of course, being a voltage source and not a power supply, meaning that there is some compromise in the maximum output current, which is limited in three ranges at 2 milliamps, 20 milliamps, and 100 milliamps in this case. And before I forget, let's uh, take a look at the backside of this unit first. And here you're looking at the rear of the unit, and you can see we have four terminals here, and these are the output, and these are the sensing terminal. And for simplicity, I just connected the sensing and uh, the output right here together. And in general, when you are doing precision measurements, you wanted to make sure that these are connected at the other end of the cable so that uh, the voltage drop developed across the wires are properly compensated. And here we have uh, the earth terminal, so you can either connect these, uh, uh, the common to earth or let it uh, stay float, like what we have here. And um, on this side, of course, we have the uh, IEEE 488 interface and uh, some digital I.O. Uh, connector here and uh, some external triggers for both input and output. So, and that's pretty much what's on the back of the unit. Okay, enough said. Let's uh, turn it back around again and power it up and take a look at uh, some of its core functions. And after that, let's open it up and see what's inside. Now I have connected the uh, 196 to the back of the output on that uh, Keithley 230 voltage source. And let me power up both unit and we'll see what we get here. So let me power up the 230 first. And this one does have a fan, as you saw earlier from the uh, back. And uh, so it's a little bit of noisy. And uh, upon powering up, you can see that we're outputting zero. So let me power up this 196. And uh, no problem at all. So I thought at first let's set up uh, a voltage. Now, of course, for this to be in spec, you have to uh, let it power up for about uh, an hour at the minimum, but uh, right now we're not going to wait for that long, so let's just uh, punch in some numbers here. So let's say uh, we wanted to set up uh, one volt, and uh, the use of this is very intuitive. So what you do is uh, source, and uh, let's uh, try this out. I haven't read the manual yet, but it should be pretty intuitive here. So we do one volt, and this is minus three, so it's millivolts, so I assume we do 1,000. 
and enter. Yep. So alternatively, I, I suppose you can do the exponent and it would do the same thing. But anyway, so it's one volt and now it's not outputting anything yet. So let's uh, do uh, output, we do operate. And you can see that we are outputting uh, 0 0.998 some uh, volts here. And we can change the range here to make it a uh, little bit, whoops, a little bit more, um, uh, has a little bit more precision here. Now, um, by looking at the number here, it looks, appears to me that it's out of spec. Uh, and let's look at the spec here. So the spec says it's uh, in one volt range. It should have an accuracy of uh, 0 0.5 percent and uh, plus a uh, one millivolt. So the 0 0.5 percent would uh, point us at uh, um, 9995 and uh, the one millivolt would uh, put us at 9985. So we're just a little bit out of uh, calibration here. Now I'm not sure if uh, after let it warm up it will come back or not, but uh, given an instrument this old and, uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's not too far out of the spec and we can probably adjust it if we want to. But right now, let's uh, just uh, keep going. And I just let the unit warm up for a few more minutes and you can see that the last few digits are actually decreasing. So meaning it's further out of spec. And uh, so that's something we definitely can take a look later on. But for the time being, let's uh, try to switch to uh, some different uh, numbers and we can see what we got here. So right now it's one volt. And of course we can go down a little bit. We can say that uh, we can go, let's say 100 millivolts. Uh, that would be 100 millivolts would be, let's try this way, exponent minus three. Hopefully I get this right. Yep, so that's 100 millivolts and we can keep the range down. And interestingly, uh, 100 millivolts, this one is within spec. So, um, so I suspect it's, you know, just borderline and uh, probably uh, we can do some adjustment later. Anyway, so that's 100 millivolts. And of course we can go all the way up to 100 volts. So let's try that. So let me do this. And I'm going to do uh, 100 volts. So volts, uh, exponent would be zero, enter, and uh, let me, uh, and yep, that's uh, our 100 volt, and it's just at, again, it's just at the borderline. It's, uh, the 100 volt is still within spec, as you can see that we have a 0.5% uh, plus 50 millivolts, so that's right in spec. So of course, being a four quadrant power supply it not only can output positive voltage and also can uh, output negative voltage, for example. So let's try a uh, negative 100 volts. So for that, we'll do 100 uh, negative and enter. So bingo. So as you can see, now we're at minus 100 uh, volts. Now, of course, we can set a lot of other parameters. For instance, we haven't really tried uh, limiting the output current and that is controlled by this I limit. So right now it's set as um, two milliamps, right? So we can easily change that to uh, 20 and 100 milliamp. For example, we can set it to 100 milliamp. And that would be uh, your maximum output current. So as you can see, we can easily use this as a very low current uh, power supply and at a very high precision here. And uh, know that uh, the uh, tempo of this unit is not all that bad. It's at uh, 5 ppm and in most of the ranges and up to 10 ppm at 100 millivolts. So that's actually quite respectful as well. So of course, being a pro -ample voltage source, we could do a lot more things than we just did using the front panel here. And one potential use of this uh, pro -ample voltage source is that to do some automated testing via GPIB. So all the commands that we did from the front panel can also be done using the computer via the IEEE-488 interface. Another useful function of this uh, voltage source is that we can store multiple data points. In this case, it's up to 100. And then later on, 
playback using either a single shot or a continuous playback. And uh, based on the dual time and voltage settings, you can potentially generate some interesting waveforms and to test your device under test. So, so that's something we're going to take a look next. And here's the setup. The output from this Keithley 230 is hooked up to that Tektronix 2465 so that when we program a set of uh, voltages through different channels and uh, play them back continuously, we can observe a waveform on that oscilloscope. The first waveform I'm going to build here is a very simple one. It's just a simply a, a pulse. And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, utilize two memory channels. The first one I'm going to set to zero, which uh, is by power on is the default. So now you can see that we're on memory channel one. And for the voltage, we're going to set it as zero, as I mentioned before. And for the dual time, let's do uh, 10 times the, max, the minimum. The minimum is 3 milliseconds, so we do 30 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds. And for the second channel, let's set it up to uh, second channel. And let's do a voltage of, say, 10 volts. So it's 10 volts. And let's have a dual time of uh, three my, uh, milliseconds. And uh, we should now be able to turn it on and observe the waveform. So let's try that. So let's set it to continuous and uh, start it. And now let me enable the output. And as you can see on the oscilloscope, we indeed have this uh, very uh, short pulses, pulse train. So that's a very easy, and of course we can build much more complex waveforms using this uh, uh, instrument here. So the next thing I'm going to build is basically a staircase. And now for that we just are going to utilize more channels. Basically, plan is for the first channel, let's say we program 0, and second channel we program as 1 volt, and then 2 volts, 3 volts, 4 volts, so on and so forth. Then we can form a staircase. So let's do that. And uh, by the way, so for that, I'm actually just going to clear the settings. And the easiest way to do that is just to power it up, off and uh, power it back on again. Unfortunately, the Keithley 230 does not have any memory backups, so that when it is powered off, uh, everything is erased. So when you power it back on, there's uh, basically um, the memory is going to be reset to the default. Okay, so let me build that on camera, and I'm going to fast forward this so you don't have to watch me. But uh, I'm going to start, and when I'm done, I will play back the waveform. Okay, so now we have entered uh, six points, and uh, we should have a nice staircase, basically, so zero volts to five volts. So let's uh, give it a shot. We set output to continuous, and uh, start, and we enable the output. And as you can see, we have a very nice uh, staircase waveform being displayed on the oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, decrease the time base, increase the time base a little bit, so you can see it more clearly here. And as you can see, that is a very nice uh, staircase waveform indeed. And because we have 100 data points on this uh, Keithley 230, you can potentially use it to generate a very complex waveform. Now, of course, the maximum refresh rate is going to be quite limited because the minimum dwell time is required at uh, 3 milliseconds. Now, as you can see, we indeed can use this uh, uh, programmable voltage source to do a lot of different things. Now, it's a pity that it doesn't have a onboard battery to permanently store these waveforms. As you saw earlier, that entering these are non-trivial, and sometimes you make mistakes. Of course, you can always go back, use a single step to verify each step. But nevertheless, as soon as it powers off, all the memory settings are going to be erased. So that's something that uh, 
to remember about this instrument here. Now we have seen this Keithley 230 programmable voltage source in action. Um, let's power it down and uh, open it up and see what's inside. And uh, this clamshell design is very easy to open up. All I needed to do was to remove these two supports at the back. Interestingly, that this one actually has some uh, support where on the Keithley 196, those were simply just screws directly screwed onto these holes and held them in place that way. So that's kind of interesting. This certainly adds some structural support here, but I'm not entirely sure why the other Keithleys are different anyway. So now we should be able to open this up. Oh, okay, here we go. Ugh. The first thing I notice is how dirty the inside is. I suspect that this unit probably was in service for a long, long time, and the fan had been on probably constantly, 24-7 maybe. So that's why you can see that there's so much dust inside this unit. So I better give it a thorough cleaning before going any further. So let me do that, and I'll be right back. Okay, so I did a quick uh, dust off, and uh, of course there's still quite a bit of dust on all the boards here, but nevertheless it's uh, clean enough for us to take a quick look here. And uh, the first thing you see is this board, and right here that's the GPIV board, and also handles some of the digi digital I.O. here in the back. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, but if you read the data codes on some of these uh, chips, you will see that this unit was probably built some time back in 87, which is uh, more than 35 years ago. Uh, that makes it even more impressive. And uh, towards the left here, we can see that uh, there is a cover clearly marked several points that you can use for uh, the cal calibration process and uh, of course we have to refer to the manual on what exactly we need to calibrate but uh, for this video we're not going to calibrate it as we saw a little bit earlier that the reading was a little bit of, uh, out of range but uh, nothing major so probably um, you know if you guys are interested we can do another video at some later time of course we're going to take off this uh, cover shortly so we can see what is uh, underneath but uh, before we do that, you can see these two uh, large transistors here, and these are actually the ones handling the main output of the, uh, uh, the voltage source going out. So these are high voltage uh, pairs, one is NPN, one is PMP. And of course, you can also see that the date code here is uh, the 40th week of uh, 87 on this one and the 21st week of 87 on this one. And when we talk about a voltage source, when you think about it, the basic operating principle is actually not that complicated. All it takes is really a precision voltage reference, uh, outputting an adjustable voltage. And in this case, it's handled by a digital to analog converter. And then we have an output stage that uh, to generate the required uh, voltage under load. And uh, so in this case, and uh, it's done in a uh, bootstrapped op-amp so that uh, the output uh, can handle from uh, 110, uh, sorry, 100 volts to minus 100 volts in that regard. It can swing uh, between the two voltage rails. So I think what I'm going to do next is uh, actually remove this cover so that we can see what is underneath. And check out these uh, long brass screws. Certainly these are not cheap. Anyway, with that removed, I also removed this cable so we can uh, uh, take this cover off. Now, as you can see, that all the uh, testing points and uh, adjustment ports are clearly marked. Okay, so now let me remove this cover. Let me zoom in a little bit more and we'll take a deeper look. Well, I might have uh, spotted an uh, issue here and not sure if you can see this. Let me zoom it in and you can see that we have a capacitor by the look of it 
here that is uh, totally blo blown up. And you can see uh, against my hand, this is the capacitor and this is the uh, remaining of what is left. I'm not sure why it did not affect anything. Maybe just uh, for some reason why I took it off and uh, it became so brittle. I don't know. Uh, but certainly this capacitor is not very happy here. So let me uh, refer to the manual and take a look at what that capacitor is. And of course, assuming that it's a capacitor. And we'll be right back and we'll see what it was doing there. And one thing I really like this old instrument is that the service menu is readily available. Look at that. So we can actually identify what component that is. So this uh, capacitor, and which is a capacitor indeed, is right between uh, these six resistors here. So it's a C304. So now let's take a look at what the C304 is. And uh, as we expected, it was a uh, 0.1 microfarad uh, ceramic disk uh, capacitor. So we can easily replace that. But of course, I need to. Uh, probably need to take out this board, even though I don't necessarily need to take out this board, but uh, I do want to take a look at what is uh, sitting behind this board, so we will do that shortly. Uh, but right now, at least uh, that makes sense, right? So that's why when we did our testing earlier, I guess everything looked pretty normal. Uh, so that's just a uh, 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor, as you can see on the next page here. So this is the one that uh, uh, is going directly against the DAC here. And that's just a 15 volt bypass capacitor. I suppose uh, you probably won't see too much of a performance degradation if that capacitor is not there. So that's a kind of uh, what we're looking at here. No big deal. And we'll certainly fix that uh, in a bit. So as we briefly mentioned earlier that uh, at the heart of this voltage source, is our uh, precision DAC, and that's what is used to generate the voltage reference here. And uh, so, if you look at the board here, that's this, uh, the U305 is uh, uh, this chip right here, socketed, and uh, I think it is ADDA08CN. So that is our uh, DAC, it's a 12-bit DAC, and uh, it has a uh, built-in voltage reference. That's why you don't see any voltage reference outside. And uh, that built-in reference actually is quite uh, uh, temperature stable. I think it's at uh, 5 ppm. So that gives this whole unit reasonable performance. Now let's take a look at what else is on this analog board. Let me uh, change the orientation here so we can see it a little bit better. And uh, let's reorient it ourselves with reference to this schematics here that I printed out for the analog portion of the circuitry. And as you can see, we have these two big transistors as indicated earlier. These correspond to Q314 and 345. So these are part of the output transistors for forming part of the bootstrap circuitry here. And then we can see these JFAS here, and they are actually used to set the gains of the output amplifier. And we can identify these on the circuit right here, and these are the potentiometers associated with the gain adjustment. So let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, we can see a little better here. And again, these are the seven JFATs that I mentioned earlier in, we, we saw in the diagram here. And these two orange components are two read relays. They are Koto branded. And they're responsible for switching in and out certain uh, resistors to form the output gain. And here we have a regular relay lying right here. And um, what else? Oh, yeah, we can see here this metal can is actually a, an AD554, which is an op amp. Um, and uh, besides that, everything else looks pretty ordinary, of course. And again, I think that's everything I wanted to show you on this board. Again, this is the DAC that is socketed here. Uh, that is a 12-bit DAC responsible for the accuracy and uh, resolution of this voltage source. And here's another look of the analog board after I took it out from the case. And if you recall, we had a, 
a capacitor that failed before, so now I also replaced that one. And that was the uh, old one that I desoldered from the board here. So there's pretty much nothing left here. I'll be sure to upload the high resolution photos from this teardown up to my website and uh, for those who are interested you can take a look. What I have forgot to mention is that this entire portion of the PCB is actually dedicated to the analog portion of the circuitry and because we're talking about a very high precision instrument the entire analog portion here is actually shielded. Uh, so as you can see here, so I took the bottom cover, so this is actually metal, and this one sits right underneath here. And on top of that, we have this uh, uh, metal enclosures as well. So the entire portion of the analog side is shielded to reduce possible interference from the outside. And what are we looking at here now is the digital board and the power supply board underneath that uh, analog board we saw earlier. And here, for example, you see that we have the main microprocessor as the MC6802, which is socketed, and we have a couple of uh, uh, firmware EEPROM. Actually, speaking of firmware, I probably am going to uh, take this out and uh, uh, make a copy of them and post it on my website. So for the, those who are interested and have similar versions of the uh, Keith Lee 230, you can certainly uh, use that to refresh your firmware. And um, so that's pretty much uh, what is inside here. Now I'm not going to bother to take out the GPIB board. As you can see that underneath it's just a transformer, there's nothing else. And this side is just the linear regulator and you can see this. these two caps are uh, the field, main filter caps for the plus and minus 100 volts rail. And um, also I'm not going to take the front panel off. This here is some standard 7 segment displays and some driver circuitry. Of course that's all linked to the digital board via this uh, ribbon cable here. And another interesting thing I wanted to point out is how the earth terminal is connected to the actual case. So if you look at this uh, green wire here, that's actually connected. The other side is the green uh, earth terminal connector. And uh, so instead of the earth terminal connector co connected directly to the case, it's actually connected via this uh, long uh, green wire and connected at this point. So not entirely sure why they did that, presumably because this is a fan and that earth terminal is happened to uh, be at one of the mounting hole of the fan here. So anyway, so that's how it is done. And also, if you look at this earth wire, that's actually the color is red. So again, not entirely sure why they chose the color red as the earth wiring. And that pretty much completes the teardown. What I forgot to show you earlier was the current syncing capability of this Keith Lee 230 programmable voltage source, uh, which I'm demonstrating here. And uh, you can see that in the power supply back there, we have a uh, 10 volt set up in both channels and uh, for channel 2 right now it's uh, at 9.48 volts and output of 48 milliamps because that's connected to the Keithley and the reason there's a voltage drop is because the Keithley is uh, set at 9.5 volts and uh, because it has current syncing capability now of course the Emerald power supply is uh, delivering current into this Keith Lee 230 programmable voltage source. So the voltage source here serves as a current load. And of course the Keith Lee 230 is a programmable voltage source and it's not a dedicated electronic load. So its current syncing capability is quite limited. In this case it's only at a maximum 100 milliamps. That's why you are seeing that we're using to test only up to 50 milliamps back there. And I hope you liked the teardown today. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up, remember to share, subscribe, and I will catch up with you next time.